You are listening to Faithless Brewing, a Magic the Gathering podcast for the Spike Rogue. Each week we design new decks for tournament play. We put our creations to the test and share our findings on the air. Coming up on the brew session, Arcane Proxy brings Snapcaster Mage into Pioneer for the first time. We've got four new decks to help see the truth about the prototype. Then on the flashback, testing results with Vesuvian Duplomancy. That's all coming up on Faithless Brewing. Thanks for listening and enjoy the show. to another episode of Faithless Brewing. I am Zach Mana Symbol Ryle coming at you from an increasingly cool Canada, but I've got beautiful autumn colors all around me and I'm joined by two fabulous co-hosts this week. First off, coming from south of the border, down Mexico way and a little further is Emiliano Sagasti, otherwise known as Mord to Light Online, otherwise known as the new Goblin King. Mord, how you doing? Hey yo. Thanks, Zach. I don't know who's the farthest away now from you, now that we have all split around the world geographically, but yeah, I have slowly became a Goblin King and I have entered my snob face. <laughs> well, don't delve too greedily or too deep, because I can't recommend the results. But someone who may be able to recommend some results that come from delving into some Indiana Jones-style caves, I assume, is none other than the CEO of the podcast. The Lodestar. At some point, I must look up what exactly that means. It's Daniel Shreveer, PhD, coming at us from, I believe, the ancient city of Jerusalem. Hello, hello, Zach. Thank you for that intro. Yeah, Indiana Jones. I mean, actually, I was just hiking a trail last week called Indiana Jones Way. So if you've seen <laughs> um, The Last Crusade... You're not serious. No, no, seriously. So in, in Jordan, they have... This ancient city called Petra, and they have a red desert called Wadi Rum. The red desert, they film a lot of movies there that are set on Mars, so like Mars Attacks, uh, The Martian with Matt Damon, Lawrence of Arabia was filmed there. But Petra, which is more of like an archaeological site in this canyon, that was very famously in Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. So if you remember, he like walks down this canyon that's all red, and then he goes into this ancient building, and then there's... I don't know, like the, the goblet that Jesus drank from or something. I don't remember exactly what he was doing. Right, right. But he was in Petra. And there's a trail that you can, you can kind of follow the trail that he takes in the movie. It's very, very cool. Really? Yeah, there's all these rock-cut tombs. It's, it's amazing. So beautiful. This American culture managing to encroach its way into every part of the planet. Exactly. <laughs> and a staple of American culture, of course, Magic the Gathering and possibly the Pioneer format... Uh, so today we're going to be doing some exploring on a brand new card from the new expansion, Brothers War. Then that card is going to be Arcane Proxy. But before we get to that, we do have uh, a little bit of housekeeping to do. We have a new patron to shout out, CPT Hammer. Thank you for contributing to the Faithless Brewing podcast. Your contributions and those of other listeners uh, help this podcast keep going, sometimes help us buy new equipment. And uh, you, of course, get a bunch of different perks with your Faithless Brewing patreon subscription you get to join us on the discord where we've got wonderful brewers passing around crazy ideas uh you get to vote on cards of the month when we do things like that i believe we'll be uh talking about one of those fairly soon so emmy can you recommend highly enough the faithless brewing podcast oh absolutely not only the podcast also the discord and also it's lovely lovely guests <laughs> I think we are easily, easily one of Emmy's top five podcasts. <laughs> easily. I would say it's even close to my top two. Wow. Can I say, can I say top one? I don't know. You, you could. Uh, if you listen to the last episode, we've got multiple top five lists concerned in the new season. Maybe Emmy's uh, top five podcast list is in there. <laughs> but we're getting, to, we're getting away from the topic of the day, which is Arcane Proxy and the brews that we have here. Our brewmaster, David Robertson, has whipped up a few of them. But before we get to those, let's talk about the card itself. So 
from Brothers War, Arcane Proxy, seven mana value artifact creature wizard. Uh, it's a 4-3, but it has the new prototype mechanic. So the prototype mechanic says you may cast this spell with different mana cost, color, and size. It keeps its abilities and types. So you can either play it for seven or one blue blue. If you play it for seven, you get a 4-3. If you get one blue blue, you get a 2-1. And when it enters the battlefield, if you cast it, exile target instant or sorcery with mana value less than or equal to arcane proxy's power from your graveyard. Copy that card, you may cast the copy without paying its mana cost. So what do you guys think of this card in general as the first card we're talking about from Brothers War? Well, I'm glad we're starting with a prototype card because I just have a hard time wrapping my head around that mechanic. I keep looking at it and thinking, oh, I can pay three and have a seven CMC permanent in play to like mess around with. And that's just not what it does. <laughs> like, yeah, it just keeps breaking my brain. It actually has mana value three when it's in play. It contributes two devotion pips to blue while it's in play, assuming you paid the three. So the sooner I learn that lesson, the better. The devotion pips is what hurts me the most, I think. Like, it's the most weird part. To, like, look at the card in play and say, this has devotion. I believe this is the first time they've ever done something like this. I am also not sure we would have to go into the notes, and maybe we have them here on the rules notes. When you have it on the stack, its mana cost might be one blue blue. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think it's almost exactly the same as double face cards as mdfcs right like imagine that the back of this card was just the same card that costs one blue blue right as far as i can tell it's functionally the same the difference is linking them is always good for these ones i think that's the biggest like on the other ones sometimes getting them to play in a different way was a disadvantage like when they are a land or they're a spell and you play them as a land here it's always better if you can somehow blink them or just bounce them well, is that really true, though? I mean, that, that's what I assume would be the case. And yet, as we see with Arcane Proxy, there's no advantage to blinking this. You just, you don't get the trigger again. And that's what's so maddening about not just this one, but so many of the prototype cards. They really don't want you to do anything funky with them. They, they don't reward you at all for blinking because they all say, if you cast it. Yeah. Right. And the most rewarding one is just like a big beater. Chunky beater. So the very first thing that came at least to David's mind, I assume to many people's mind, is, oh my gosh, you can do all these loops with Arcane Proxy. <laughs> like, <laughs> our notes from last week outlined all these elaborate loops you can do. And it's like, oh, actually, no, you can't. You can't do these. No, just like Lutri, those, that, that thought path leads to disappointment. Which I think leads to the dark side. <laughs> <laughs> We're not going down the Grievous Hole again. Don't tempt me. I will go. <laughs> the Grievous Hole. <laughs> Oh boy. All right, let's 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 pull Emmy back out of the grievous hole. Um because there are some cool things you can do with this card. So, uh, not looping, but casting cards with null mana cost that don't have a mana cost. These cards that are traditionally played in cascade decks, that is one of the things that you can do with this. Okay. I mean, you you could just play it play it fair, right? You could just use this to flashback a small burn or or, or a card draw spell. And particularly, there's one card draw spell that we have a lot of uh, affection for in Pioneer, although we never really made it work that well, which is See the Truth. So that one in particular uh, has a special condition where if you cast it out of your graveyard, instead of a mediocre draw spell, you just get to Ancestral Recall. So that's interesting. Yeah, and notably, that, that works off of the prototype mode of Arcane Proxy. So in theory, you could, you could curve out quote-unquote curve out <laughs> turn two anticipate right. at sorcery speed turn three arcane proxy at sorcery speed recast see the truth draw three cards yeah and just an overall comment on the rate of arcane proxy the the two blue blue mode i mean that's the only mode i imagine ever being seriously considered in your deck building the seven mana four three that is a terrible rate to get a copy of a four or three CMC spell. I, I can't not imagine what that would be. Uh, I, I, yeah. Maybe for standard. So here's a question for you. Because, yeah, I think rate is a big part of the draw of this card. If I cast Arcane Proxy for three and I flash back a spell that costs two, I'm getting a better rate than Snapcaster Mage, correct? Correct. Absolutely. For exactly that, yes. Does that mean I should have a lot of twos in my deck? 
Because like the best spells are going to be like consider opt, fatal push, false is whatever. Is it good enough if I'm just flashing back a one? Maybe if we can just like if they're they could have to be in the majority sorcery, so we don't waste on the fact that we are not playing the Vanessa speed. Right, and I think that is a very pioneer question. Uh, in modern, the reason that I still will tell you that Snapcaster Mage is better than this card and will always be is because. Uh, the one mana spells are so much more powerful on average. And the two mana spells are more powerful on average, but you get to play things like Counterspell off of it, right? Snapcaster Mage has Flash. You can use it with Counterspells. Arcane Proxy doesn't have that flexibility. And in Pioneer, I, I believe a lot of the two mana spells are a good leap more powerful than the one mana spells. You see two mana removal spells in decks much more commonly because they have to be. Uh, that you don't have the same options at one mana. So let me ask you about the null mana cost. This is, again, something that Snapcaster Mage cannot do. Do you think that's a realistic plan for the card? Most of the decks we're going to talk about are Pioneer decks that David has prepared for us. There is, however, always a possibility, okay, throw this into your Crashing Footfalls deck. It's Cascade compatible. It can be like your fifth copy of Rhinos, for example, if you've exhausted the first four. Is there anything there? I my initial feeling is no. Um, those if you've played against the Rhinos deck, y you know that if you get through the first Rhinos, there will be many behind it in most game states. Uh, it's not uncommon for me if the game goes, I don't know, to turn seven or eight to have three or four copies of Rhinos thrown at me. That said, if the Rhinos players need to be more grindy and they need to start reusing copies out of their graveyard, this isn't the worst rate to do so. Um, so my initial response is definitely not for Living End, uh, probably not for Glimpse combo, Glimpse of Tomorrow, but possibly in Rhinos. It, it's not the worst idea. I just don't think it's going to get there. Um, much like I believe the, was it, Sion of Draco hasn't stuck around? Hmm. Uh, I just don't think this is good enough for the large majority of games. Yeah, it's an opportunity cost thing. Every time you draw an arcane proxy, that could have been another cascade spell or something else. Like, right? Could be a fury. It could have been a force negation. Like the, the, the slots are so uh, such a premium already. I just can't imagine this being better than most of the other options that you have. Yeah, and for glimpse, I mean, again, because of that cast clause, it doesn't recast glimpse like Goblin Dark Dwellers does, so... Correct, <sighs> yeah. If you, yeah. Can, if, you could, if you could flip into it and then it did the thing, then, then we'd be talking, because this is a much more competitively cost card, costed card for that deck than uh, Dark Dwellers. But it doesn't, so we're not. Okay, well, maybe that's all there is to say about the card from a theory perspective. Uh, maybe we should just see how the card looks when we surround it with 56 of its friends. Right, and to that end, our brewmaster, David Robertson, has put together some great-looking deck lists for us, uh, specifically in the Pioneer format. Cards aren't on an MTGO yet, so we've just got some uh, pictures. Um, maybe by the time this episode uh, comes out that we'll be able to have goldfish links, etc. Um, looks like we do. All right, Zach, tell me about Shardless Demir. That sounds promising, Shardless Demir. Yeah, okay, so... Uh, the opening lines of this deck have been constructed by uh, David because uh, we've got copies of See the Truth. There are t uh, three copies of See the Truth in this deck list. So for those who don't quite remember its exact text, I'm going to have to look it up myself. But it's uh, one in a blue. I believe it's look at the top three cards of your library, put one in your hand and the other two on the bottom. Correct. But if it was if it's cast from your grave or it's cast from anywhere except your hand. Yes. You draw three. So the idea is we're going to put that in the graveyard and then cast it with Arcane Proxy. And we have several ways we can do that. Um, we have Ledger Shredder uh, in this deck. Now, there's no zero mana costs. So Ledger Shredder doesn't get it into the graveyard as quickly as you'd like. But what Ledger Shredder does do uh, is it connives when you play your second spell on a turn. So there's a bunch of one mana plays uh, available in this deck. Fatal Push, Thought Seize, Consider, Cling to Dust. So you play one of those on one, you play the Ledger Shredder on two. It won't connive then, but when you play your Arcane Proxy on three and play your one-drop cost card again, uh, you will get a connive there. 
So that's a fine card that uh, at that point can dump a Seed of Truth into the graveyard. Then we all also have the new card, Evangel of Synthesis, which in part is a blue-black 2-3, and when it enters the battlefield, you get to draw and discard. Then you can put the Seed of the Truth in, and on turn three, draw three cards. So that's your uh, most powerful Seed of the Truth line, is to uh, get a turn three Ancestral Recall attached to your 2-1. Yeah, I think that's actually probably the most aggressive start for the deck. Turn two, Evangel, yeah. discard, see the truth. Turn three, Arcane Proxy, draw three cards, and that also satisfies the Evangel's condition to give it plus one, plus one menace. So you're up yeah. a bunch of cards, you've got a three, three menace attacking. Like, you're not an aggro deck. You're, I think you're still mid-range, but you're doing well. I'd call this blue-black tempo. Yeah, I'd call this blue-black tempo. Yeah, it's it's definitely something you can do. Um, if you were to put in, uh, was that Rona's Vortex, the the bounce spell that you kind of like that uh, is is like can mm. kick into a vindicate. Yes. Um, you can cast that with Arcane Proxy and pay the kicker cost. It will cost you a total of six mana to get that vindicate, but in the late game that might not be bad. So that's a consideration for this deck that I I just thought of. Oh, that's a good call, actually. Yeah, I kind of forgot about that. Yeah, so Rona's Vortex is a single blue mana. You can bounce. Is it a creature or artifact? Creature, a planeswalker you don't control. Kicker is two in a black. Shuffles it in. There you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the kicker is two in the black. Exactly. And then it becomes a, like a Vindicate. So that, that's a potential card for this deck, I think. Emmy, you've been playing a little bit Pioneer. I have as well. What do you think of this deck and potentially adding Rona's Vortex to it? The deck also has, I mentioned most of the cards, but we've got the Ledger Shredders. We've got two copies of uh, New Edition to the format Go for the Throat, one Eliminate, and two copies of Treasure Cruise. All right. So we got all the bangers in this set of colors. My biggest problem I see right now is what's our win condition, which I hate saying because I really don't like win conditions. But no, I, I agree with you. I mean, it's kind of like a blue-black tempo aggro kind of deal. Um, there's three Hive of the Eye Tyrants and one Hall of Storm Giants in the mana base. I, I feel like I'd want at least an initial Storm or Hall of uh, Storm Giants. It's only 23. Okay, it's not only 20. It's 23 lands. And with the Treasure Cruises and the Sea of the Truths, I feel like we'll be able to just keep hitting land drops and get up to Hall of the Storm Giants yeah. levels. My biggest fear is only 12 creatures. Well, it's 12 plus the hives. I mean, yeah. Yeah, and the hives. And the, and the hull. Maybe a second hull fixes all my issues. Hull is such a good way to close games when you're ahead. Yeah, but I, I, playing these blue-black decks in the past in Pioneer, uh, I definitely have had a lot of games where you're like, yes, I got all their, like, all their resources are done. How the hell am I killing them? And it just takes you forever to do it. <laughs> uh, yeah, I can see that happening here. The win condition here is drawing three cards a bunch of times. So yeah. it's two treasure yeah, crews, exactly. three see the truth. We didn't talk about finding the third path. David has put four copies of that here. Oh, I completely missed that. Yeah, so that's a saga that also has a kind of snapcaster mage-ish uh, part to it. Yeah, it's even more. It's even more snapcastery. That's also going to help fuel our treasure cruises. And it also can cast see the truth. So that's an excellent... Um, kind of uh, rule of eight thing on uh, ways to cast see the truth so let me tell you something if you want to draw cards good golly oh my is this gonna draw you a lot of cards this deck the thing this deck does the most is draw cards i can see myself milling out by play in like if you play a league of this i can see one game that it's up with you just oh yeah milled. and it really reminds me of fond memories playing a maze mind tome with oh what's the card from war of the spark which one? Anyway, there's a card that removes counters from things to draw draw cards. Um, Soul Diviner. Soul Diviner. Soul Diviner, the 2-mana 2-3. Two yeah, yeah, yeah. This reminds me of Soul Diviner. That deck had a lot of trouble killing people, but good lord did you draw a lot of cards. So, Founding the Third Path, that's really interesting. Um, I don't know how I feel about that card still, but... I mean, it makes sense. Like, it works with See the Truth and Treasure Cruise. I don't know if I need all four copies, but yeah, I think this would be the question in my mind as I test this deck. So David drew this up to be like the clean, sleek version. He actually has specific notes here. He says, don't try splashing into green. Just just play clean, two-color mana base. You're very good at having three power creatures in play. You're very good at drawing three cards. 
you are relying heavily on the fatal push go for the throat thought seize package to like solve all your problems and you know rebind them with arcane proxy as needed and it's entirely possible that like once you actually get in the matchup you'll find that you don't have a broad enough range of stuff to actually win the game but in theory land i mean this is a beautiful deck and i think it's a great starting place i have a crazy thought that i want to add some copies like two of um cityscape leveler oh god just because i feel like you're i just feel like you're gonna get enough mana that like as like just because you're gonna be drawing three all the time and just hitting your land drops and eventually you're like here's my eight eight trample that vindicates something well now i'm okay what if instead of that we play right. the um the three one the blade whip transmogrant instead because that comes back pretty yeah. cheaply doesn't ask questions yeah that's true so, uh, hold on, let me get it. Because you actually had the, the Razor Lash t- Transmogrant. So That's you had it, the name Razor wrong Lash, in the last po- podcast. No, it's, it's fine. I, my I, mistake, I didn't. my mistake. Yeah. No, no, it's fine. So, uh, Razor Lash tra- Transmogrant, two mana for a 3-1 that cannot block. Artifact, creature, zombie. Four black, black, return it from your graveyard to the battlefield with a plus one, plus one counter on it. This ability costs four less to activate and if an opponent controls four or more non-basic lands. That's a much more reasonable thing uh, than what I was suggesting. Um, so I don't like it as much, but yes, <laughs> that that is a good uh, threat to add or something that pops back out of the graveyard, right? Yeah, a recurring threat. Yeah, you're yeah. correctly identifying that you do loot so much, it's almost free to play one or two cards like that. Right, right. Absolutely. Um, I just want to go big, but I, I understand that this is the much smarter choice. Well, Zach, if you want to go bigger, maybe you need to go out of Demir. Maybe you want okay. to look at this next brew. So David has also given us... Oh, baby. An is it version. I love Crackling Drake. So this is a variation on uh, a Drake's deck. This got somebody uh, on the Pro Tour, actually. Uh, there was a oh, Drake's oh, deck in Pioneer. I can't, can't remember who it was. I, can't some, I would never remember. Yeah, some, human being. I don't know. Um, Seemed like a good guy. It's esports doesn't count. Esports is dead now. Yeah, I mean, he's, listen, he's he's a nice guy. He just couldn't find his copies of otherworldly gays or consider. <laughs> he wasn't playing an optimal. The list. vendors didn't have case. any considers, <laughs> so I had to play gays instead. Of course, of course. Let's <laughs> let's right, blame him. Let's blame it on that. All right. So, more. Do you want to take us through uh, the arcane proxy blue red deck? Of course. So we have. The starting package of 8 countries, 4 consider, 4 op, 2 beautiful spike field hazards as slant slash pingers, and 4 strangle. Follow that, we have 4 ledger shredder, 3 see the truth once again, the golden number it seems for David, and 2 is a charms, modern, pioneer, standard, staple, every single format was is a charm. Then of course our full playset of arcane proxy, then 4 fable of the mirror breaker, 4 crackling drake, and 2 treasure cruise. So we have arcane proxy as our Three drop, an additional value three drop that can either get back a removal, draw a card, or just in the best case scenario, cast a seeded truth for the back breaking three mana treasure cruise with a body. So if you compare this deck to the Demir one we just described, the blue spells are almost identical, right? Same numbers. Yeah. The only difference is that in this is it version, David has gone for the full eight cantrips, ops and considers, whereas in the Demir build, only considers. So with more cantrips, you're actually a lot less interactive. Like the total number of interactive slots here is smaller than in the black version. He only has the strangles, the two is it charms, and the spike field hazards. So this deck is not as good at solving problems, I would say. It is better at just like saying, hey, can you answer this crackling drake? It's freaking huge, and I'm going to copy it with Reflection of Kiki Jiki next turn. Right. It's crazy to look at this and be like, ha, huh, is this even more threat light than the other one? It almost might be. It might be. Yeah. Which is insane. Well, it's, it's quite similar. I mean, the black one had Evangel. This one has Crackling Drake. Crackling Drake is a little more resilient. This one also has Fable. Yeah. It's not only more resilient, it's also a lot more dangerous. It's a big boy. It's a big boy. My tweak would be to add more interaction. Like... You don't want to Absolutely. hamstring yourself by like drawing three bunch of times and like not actually having. You don't need to draw three. You just need to draw that fifth strangle effect. 
Like that's all you needed to win. Right. <laughs> so play, just play a little more interaction, I think, and then I'd be comfortable taking this into a league. Yeah, I'm pretty high on Is It Charm after the the ten matches I played with um with the blue red deck last week. So I, I wouldn't mind seeing more copies of that in here at all. Yeah, I mean, and that goes back to that thing we were talking about at the beginning, like Arcane Proxy, you love to flash back a two mana spell. Are there two mana spells that we're actually happy to play? Like there there aren't that many in these lists, right? See the truth is kind of iffy. There's not like a Dreadbore or Abrupt Decay class card that's like a staple effect at two. And David specifically said, don't play Drawn of the Lock. Yeah, I would like to maybe see Roast in this deck list. That was a card we talked about. Um, it's one and a red, deal five damage to a creature that doesn't have flying. We've, we talked about it a bunch of times, David and myself, but I haven't seen it in a lot of deck lists, but it kills uh, all the creatures in Mono Green except for Cavalier of Thorns. But that is, that is a pretty nice one. Maybe it's a sideboard card, but uh, it, it, yeah. What about the new one, the Obliterating Bolt? One in a red, sorcery, four to a creature, a planeswalker, plus exile. Oh, yeah, or that. that that'd that be nice. Uh, I mean, I, I don't, I'm not exactly sure if that's the card you need, but... Or Fires of Victory. Yeah. Hmm. Food for thought. So, yeah, to be explored. Yeah, fires of victory. You can you can kick that in theory for six mana. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. exactly. So that could be a nice option. All right, so those are I think pretty safe builds. Demir and is it? We're just trying to flashback, see the truth. But uh, let's let's get a little more risky. You know, let's spice it up. Yeah, these are respo- These are responsible, honest brews. These ones get up for their nine to five. And uh, they're working every day, but but let's let's see what the crazy staying up late. But yeah. you know, people are here to also listen to some really bad ideas. Oh yeah. <laughs> so let's get nuts. So we've got an arcane proxy. What is this? Salty list uh, with a very fair staple. Seder Wayfinder. Seder Wayfinder has never been in a deck that has done anything obnoxious or cruel to anyone ever. Um, Never. and it's, it's here doing a very responsible thing. So, <laughs> uh, for those who have access to the show notes, don't miss the wonderful memes from David. So this is Arcane Form. It's a salt eye list, as I said, blue, black, and green. So we've got four Fatal Push, two Abrupt Decay, four Grizzly Salvage, four Neoform, four Seder Wayfinder, one Champion of Wits, three Arcane Proxies, and one Glasspool Mimic. One Blood for Bones, one Kalitas, one, uh, another four drop, Shielded the Apocalypse, and one Airtie, Resurrected. Then at the five slot, we've got three Perennial Behemoths. We've got, uh, at the six slot, two Tassiger, the Golden Fang, one Noxious Gearhulk, one Vorinclex Monstrous Raider, uh, and one uh dragon lord silumgar we've got one coma <laughs> cosmo serpent and one titan of industry at the absolute top what are we reading here well blood for bones is a reanimation spell uh it has you was it discard a card and sacrifice a creature it's a zombify but let, let's forget about that that's that's gonna be cut oh. instantly from the deck <laughs> yeah yeah it's what? a card it's a card that's never good I, sorry i just i'm just i'm just reading through all this and i'm I'm just a little confused. I know, I know we're neoforming Tassiger. Like, that's definitely part of the plan here. Let's focus on, yeah, the spells of the two slot, because I was just complaining about how in those responsible decks we're just flashing back consider we're not getting max value on Arcane Proxy. Yeah. This deck is going the far opposite stream. Like, these are high-value two-mana spells. <laughs> it's getting all the greediness. Abrupt Decay, Grissy Salvage, Neoform... Arcane Proxy flashing back a Neoform. Now you may be thinking, wait a second, wait a second. I thought you just said that that doesn't work, right? Because it's CMC is three. And David is aware of this. We're not actually trying to sacrifice the Arcane Proxy. However, that is an option. So what you've got is you've got these like little mini tutor packages at three to four. So like if you do want to Neoform your Arcane Proxy, you have several four drops to choose from. But the line that is more common is actually with this perennial behemoth. So what we're going to do is we're going to like set up self-mill. We're going to grissy salvage. We're going to set our wayfinder, get some junk in the graveyard. Eventually, we'll put Perelion Behemoth into the graveyard. 
what do we do on turn four? We unearth it for GG. We make a land drop from the graveyard, our fourth land drop. So we've gone card parity there. Then we cast a Neoform from our hand, sacrifice a perennial behemoth to get any six. So that's why you see this weird collection of sixes that Zach mentioned. Right. So we've got uh, Vorinclex, Noxious Gear Hulk, or Dragon Lord Silumgar there as the payoffs. Vorinclex, very cute, will double the Neoform counter. So you get an 8 8 Trample Haste. <laughs> I think that's adorable. Yeah. You also have the Taskers there because maybe you just want to delve to a six drop and then neoform the Tasker into a Titan of Industry. Right. That definitely makes sense. Bunch of different possibilities for neoforming. One thing that's so cool or cute is that during the process of self milling, digging for your perennial behemoths, you are very likely to also accidentally mill the neoform. And that's great because Arcane Proxy just finds it right there. Like Greasy Salvage can find the Arcane Proxy and dump the Neoform in the graveyard at the same time. So it's all coming together. You have an interesting line. If you have a Seder Wayfinder in play, then when you play the Arcane Proxy, you can Neoform the Wayfinder into a Glass Pool Mimic or Champion Wits. The Glass Pool Mimic can copy your Proxy, and then you have the, the, the full set. Only one cast. No, I know. I, I'm not <laughs> saying you're going to get another thing to cast. I never was saying that. It was going to give you, but this isn't, this doesn't actually end up being interesting because then you get a clone of a 2 1 for 1 blue blue. You don't get the 7 cost. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's devastating that you just don't gain anything from Neoforming into an Arcane Proxy, but I think that's why the Champion of Wits is there, so that if you do need to do that line. Yeah. That's why the Glass Pool Mimic confuses me in this list in general. I, I think it's just because it's an MDFC. Like, it's just there because it's fine to play um but that probably should be the fourth proxy probably i don't know i think it's a fairly low cost part of your mana base i mean if you already have something valuable in play you might want to change a setter wayfinder for a glass pull mimic to copy something else i'm just pretty sure i want this deck to be playing four proxies not three i mean apart from being the card of the week do you feel like it's like the strongest card in the deck or is it just like a role player it's not the strongest card in the deck, but it's just, I feel like once you, you have all these things that mill you, and I want enough of the payoff, I guess, is my, because if you have a perennial behemoth and a neoform in the graveyard and a proxy in your hand, that's a five mana combo turn. It is, yeah, correct. It's not as slick as the four, but like, why would I want to decrease the number of times I get to do my powerful thing of neoforming a behemoth? Yeah, that, that makes sense. Yeah. So kind of Tassiger, maybe. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yes, yeah, yeah. I just, yeah, it, it, exactly, exactly that. Or just fudge with the numbers, right? Like, I, I don't know if we need the exact, exactly certain numbers of certain cards here. We probably don't need two sevens. We should just pick one. I think one seven is enough. Right. Right. Is it, like, yeah, I mean, most of the games are just going to win with either Koma or Tyran. Right, and if I was going to, well, but also if I was going to, I feel like I'd be the person who'd just, like, play two Titans, right? Because you can end up with two of them in play, but, like, I don't know, I, I don't know how good Coma actually is in the format. Regardless, this, this is a sweet, powerful brew uh, with some interesting numbers to tweak with and the ability to change out some of the payoffs if you need to. Yeah, and I guess the, the last thing I should say, even though I want to cut Blood for Bones, it is noteworthy that this, this is a 4-mana spell, so in some games, you will get to 7-mana. In the previous two decks, there, there was nothing that a 7-mana proxy could cast that a 3-mana proxy couldn't already cast. Right. But that doesn't mean you have to build that way. Like, maybe you should include just, like, one synergistic spell that costs a lot. And Blood for Bones is that card in this deck. So I think that's why it's there. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, it's also one that is totally fine to draw. Like it may be four mana, but it's it, fine-ish to draw. It's not great, but yeah, I said fine. It's it, w that's why you're not playing more than one. It's just it's just in there for the. Now that said, it doesn't like, like it, it may just be correct not to play it and just you know you're you're not casting arcane proxy for seven. You're just not. That's not part of the plan. It's not part of the plan. It's a three drop. Like it's a three drop. You should look at it as a three drop. Right. Exactly. And that may be the that may be more correct. Right. It's just, it's just fine to ignore that it has that text. All right, one last deck list here from David. And this one, I 
don't think we should think of this as an arcane proxy deck so much as a deck that happens to include one copy. It's got four neoforms and it's got one arcane proxy. So this is kind of like a, as, as we're brainstorming what you can do with neoform, this is on the direction you could go with a neoform deck. But the synergies here is just like, if you happen to draw the one of arcane proxy at some point in the game, you might want to rebuy your neoform. Or there's a one copy of recommission in here as well, which is a, like a, a white unearth. Yeah, one and a white. Yeah, but apart from those five cards, there's actually nothing here for Arcane Proxy to do. There's no other spells. It's all creatures. <laughs> it's just a collection of your favorite creatures and bant colors that David thinks might be well positioned in the current metagame. So six Mana Dorks, three Voice Resurgence, two Seagate Stormcaller, and that's like one of the power lines, quote unquote. Seagate Stormcaller, follow that up with a Neoform, you double it, you end up with two, three drops of your choice like two Risen Reefs or something, for example, or Extraction Specialists. So if you go to the three drops, you see two Extraction Specialists, two Risen Reefs. And then the rest of the deck is a bunch of one-ofs. One-ofs that might be useful in different situations. There's a Fibble Fip, there's a Spirited Companion, there's a Crawl Harpooner, there's a Thalia. Why is Arcane Proxy with the four drops? I think it's just there because it's not part of the chains. Like, you never want to oh, okay. for it because it doesn't do anything. It's just, like, a card that you could play. And TBH, I don't think, is important to the plan here. So yeah, this yeah, is maybe not like... like an Arcane Proxy deck. This is just, like, a deck that David thought of while brewing in this space. Well, it's, it's also that the... It's also that what, what Proxy does a lot of the time in this list is you play it and get a Neoform out of your graveyard and sacrifice it immediately to get one of the four drops. So that kind of makes sense. Yeah, yeah, it works as a super fast way to get a 4-drop after you have already used a Neoform. I used to play this in Modern, never got this deck to pop off, got a number of 4 ones. like, remember the good old... No, Kaya, uh, the Tunneling Cat, loved that deck and was playing it a lot for about a week. I loved it, I was playing it, a I got a few 4 ones, but it just died. Yeah, it, 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 never, it never ended up being good enough. See Stormcaller plus Neoform and get either Helios plus Spike Feeder or like double Fulminator or double Ma double three three Maus. Yeah, or just Eternal Witness and another card. Like there was a whole bunch of just yeah, and you kept popping off just disgusting things you can do with it, but it, it just doesn't end up being good enough. It was also super fun that the Spike Feeder enters with an additional counter due to Neoform, which meant yes. So you had redundancy against removal with your Heliod combo. Yeah, they needed, like, three removal spells to stop it because you just tried to combo again by removing another counter. Super fun. Well, I'm just glad the recent attempts I have saw online to um, uh, make Helia great again in Modern did not succeed. So, for this Bant list, I mean, David is saying it's basically similar to Bant Humans, just without Collected Company. It's going to give you pretty solid mid-range matchups. Right, whether it can keep up with like spirits or a deck that's trying to really go over the top, like mono green, probably not. But as far as like battling Rakdos goes, this would be a fun way to do that with a kind of a creature toolbox and tutoring angle. So that's what you're getting from this deck, and I do see how proxy fits. That's just like an interesting part of the plan the fact that it can rebuy a powerful spell like Neoform. Mm. All right, so that's four ways to brew Arcane Proxy and Pioneer. What do you guys think? I mean, are you sold on the card yet? Are we leaving stones unturned? I think I'm mostly sold. I'm, I'm tried, sold on trying the Sultai list because it looks so wheat. Yeah, I think it's the Sultai list for me. Just the complete insanity on it. I think that <laughs> and if I was going for one of the more reasonable ones, I think I like the Demir a lot more. Just feels like I'm doing something different. I don't know, the, the Izzet version has Crackling Drake, and Crackling Drake is so much more proven than any of the cards in that Demir version. Um, oh, exactly. But who likes playing proven cards? Sure, absolutely. And I, I, I definitely think that, like, if you want to play See the Truth, now the truth has been seen, because we've got Arcane Proxy and Founding the Third Path as ways to cast it that are, you know, not insane. I still don't like Founding the Third Path that much, so I, I don't know if you ever should play the full four copies of it, but. Yeah, you, you definitely don't have to. Like, I, I will probably start yeah. with the Demir one myself just because, you know, I, I ranked Evangel number two as my most impactful Pioneer card. So got to put the reps in to like make that happen. But 
you don't have to play anything nonsense. Like I, th I think the draw to that deck to me is it's so clean. The mana curve is beautiful. Everything's so efficient. Apart from like founding the third path and see the truth, like everything, everything you do is He's on power level. Yeah, exactly. So let's trim some third paths and just put in I don't know more removal or something. But the problem I have with the founding path list is the fact that you have the see the truth only as a three of, and the huge advantage of founding is actually see the truth. But it's also a huge advantage of Arcane Proxy. Like, you're trying to level us two cards to level a bad one that you're only playing three copies of. So go to four. Right, so, like, commit to the nonsense. Play, play the fourth, see the truth. Yeah, and maybe go down on the foundings to replace that because you have the Arcane Proxy to trigger it off. I agree. Yeah. All right. Okay, well, we will report back uh, next time once the set is online and we've had a chance to actually test these. So we've got a little flashback here. Uh, I played a brew of Dave Robertson's featuring the card uh, Vesuvian Duplomancy. So this is an enchantment for three and a blue. Whenever you cast a spell that targets only a single artifact or creature you control, create a top token that's a copy of that artifact or creature, except it's not legendary. Luckily, none of the payoffs we chose are legendary. Um, so what are we doing here? We're playing a deck that I'm going to and drop the link for into our show notes for my compatriots here. Uh, da, 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 da. Flashback section. There you go. Dream Decker link. There you go. So uh, we're playing uh, Vesuvian Duplomancy, and the feature cards of this deck, I would say, are Goblin Dark Dwellers. That's three red red for a 4-4 four, four menace. When it enters the battlefield, you may cast target instant or sorcery card with converted mana cost three or less from your graveyard without paying its mana cost. If that card would be put into your graveyard this turn, exile it instead. And four co or two copies of Glorybringer. There's also one in the sideboard. So the basic uh, plan with this deck was over the course of the game, you play some spike field hazards or fiery impulses or braids or is it charms. All of these are removal spells that deal less than four damage. So that when you get your Vesuvian Duplomancy onto the battlefield on turn four, and then you play Goblin Dark Dwellers on turn five, for each targeted damage spell in your graveyard, you will end up with a copy of Goblin Dark Dwellers. Plus, you'll get one more spell to cast at the end of that. So, if you've got three cards in your graveyard that can target the Dark Dwellers, you're going to end up with four 4-4 four, four Menace. Uh, we're also playing some Kiora Behemoth Beckoner, because uh, our combo involves cards that have four power that will draw us a card whenever they're copied. And we've got four copies of Bone Crusher Giant, because not only is it a three mana four power creature, but it's got the stomp half, gets a double as removal. It's a great card. Yeah, it's a well, it's a great card in the format, but it's also targeted removal that you can use uh to start the chain. So if you have a Glorybringer or Dark Dwellers in play, you can cast Stomp on it and get a copy. Glorybringer is especially powerful in this deck um, because yes, it doesn't get you don't get free copies like you do with Dark Dwellers, but you get copies of a 4-4 Flying Haste that has uh, Exert to deal 4 damage to target creature, which is pretty powerful right now. So uh, we've also got Fable of the Mirror Breaker in this list, just because it's one of the best cards in the format. And we've got two Hall of the Storm Giants in the mana base that help us uh, beat up on opponents. So I took this into the leagues. I played two full leagues. The first one ended up being a little bit disappointing, and I wanted to run it back. Um, and overall, I will say once again, I am not the most experienced with the ins and outs of the Pioneer format right now, and I made some spectacular misclicks um, that lost me two separate games. How bad were them? They were very tight. Well, one of them was failing to exert, exert Glorybringer. Oh no. Um, I, was, I went attack with all, and for some reason my brain just thought that Glorybringer would just exert itself. Um, but he was feeling lazy, so I get it. He didn't want to. Right, you have to tell him specifically to do that. Uh, and I forget what the other punt was, but it was something... Oh, it was uh, I, I played a Spike Field Hazard instead of, as a land instead of casting it. Um, because I would have had two Glorybringers, uh, and I ended up with only one. And also, the fact that I played it as a tap land meant I couldn't play the two-mana spell in my hand. <laughs> so that, that hurt. 
Yeah, Magic Online mistakes, they happen sometimes. Anywho, uh, overall, this was, it was pretty good. And it was able to keep up with the format at large. I felt a lot better about the synergistic pieces than I did uh, with the red, uh, red, blue, Riel deck from a couple weeks ago. With the big difference being that um, Vesuvian Duplomancy, even though it is like kind of a four mana do nothing, um, this deck has a lot of rummage effects, so you can always toss it if you don't need it. And on top of that, it, it, it doesn't just die to all the other removal in the format. That's the biggest problem with the card like Riel is that, yeah, her effect is powerful, but she's an 0-3 creature. Everyone is ready to kill three toughness creatures. Not that many people are ready to kill your enchantments. Yeah. The downside of this deck was the usual downside of a deck like this, where sometimes you drew too many of uh, one piece without the other. Uh, although, luckily, both Goblin Dark Dwellers and Glorybringer are just pretty okay cards on their own. Um, same with Kiora. So I, I don't have a lot of specific notes on uh, the gameplay, although the video, I believe, is on my YouTube uh, and uh, the replay is probably still available on my Twitch. Yeah, I was able to watch you stream, I think, most of these matches. What was striking to me was how, like, very often you get to a situation where it's like, okay, you have a dupe Mancy in play, you're a little bit behind on board, and you've only got one card in hand. Kind of looks like you're toast, right? But Actually, like if you happen to draw Dark Dwellers next turn, you're gonna make a ton of four fours. You just pop off, right? And it's not necessarily game winning, but it it is like gonna change things. You actually are are alive essentially, and this came up a few times where it's like, hmm, it's weird how the deck kind of just like provides power in spurts. Like if you're not specifically doing the diplomacy thing, like the rest of the cards are just like okay, trade one for one, and maybe I occasionally two for one you, but. Like, yeah, the Duplomancy thing is just, like, super powerful, but in a clunky way. Yeah, it's definitely... Uh, this is this Powerful in a clunky way should be the slogan of this Discord. Super powerful, but in a clunky way. Of, of this podcast. Yeah, exactly. Of this, yeah, of this podcast. Super powerful in a clunky way. I completely agree with that. So is this going to be a meta changing meta player uh in the pioneer format no the xerox core of just playing like eight plus cantrips and treasure crews is is it is so much better than what this is uh but this can keep up with the format and that's really exciting like if you want a cool brew that's really fun to play um i highly recommend taking this one out because it is a wild good time and you don't, I, I didn't feel like a dog in most matchups. It was when it got to that grindy mid-game section, uh, you just couldn't, you couldn't keep up. Yeah, I mean, specifically the issue was, at least as I saw it, was that like some decks in Pioneer are just going to keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Whereas this deck kind of tops out at a certain point. Like you, you ran up against Mono Green and the Karuga Fires deck a couple of times. Right. You're able to like keep pace on the early turns, right? There's tons of interaction via strangles and abrades and is it charms, but that doesn't win the game, doesn't end the game. That just sort of extends it into that dangerous middle section where it's like, okay, you're threatening to make some four four menaces at some point, but they're also threatening to just go off with Kenrith or with uh, you know, just the full Nick Those Karn Kiora combo. Like Right, exactly that. A couple of times they did that. They did that to you like one turn before you were able to do your thing, and you can't really stop them. Like once you've committed to all these kind of fun four and five drops as your top end, you really don't have the slots left to stop the opponent from doing their thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say that uh, Karuga Fires felt like it was. If you like the style of this deck, but you want something that's more competitive. That just felt like a su like infinitely superior version of kind of what we were doing in that they have like some soft synergy pieces like they've got like Vesuvian Duplomancy and Fires of Invention, I think, are kind of a reasonable comparison in that they're these clunky four drops that on their own really don't do anything. Um, but it's what you're able to team them up with that makes them, you know, worth playing. And um, the way Fires affected their game was insane compared to duplomancy uh, on mine most of the time if you had the right setup duplomancy plus goblin dark dwellers was better than what they were doing but it required a fairly specific uh you know play pattern to have happened before that point 
they had a lot better fail states uh, with, yeah. uh, I would say they had a much higher floor. The worst their deck could be was way better than this. My biggest fear was the game we, I think we were streaming with us to Monogreen where we just never, st the moment they started popping off, we just never stood a chance. Yeah, and, and that happened multiple times. Monogreen, you have some interaction for their early game, but it's just, they're, it's just too easy for them to go off. It's so easy. That is insane. It's crazy. It's crazy now uh, how resilient that deck is between Cavalier of Thorns and Old Growth Troll. It's, it's, it is the biggest problem with Pioneer, in my opinion, is the mono green deck. It is not, they are not playing the same format as everyone else. And you did win like a match and some games against Mono Green in the in the times you faced yeah, it, but absolutely, th those are games that go to plan. Where it's like, okay, they they play an elf, I kill it. They play a cure, I counter it. But not yeah. every game happens that way. Is if they at all have anything going on, like in the middle turns, <laughs> you just can't yeah. stop them. Like you can't stop them from resolving these things. Nope. And once they start going, it's insane how fast it go it it, it goes out of control. It takes about one turn. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, but not not a bad result at all. Not a bad result at all. I, I made some, you know, medium sideboarding decisions at some points. I will say that like two Narset in the sideboard for the matchups they were supposed to come in didn't feel like enough. But I also, it, it's tricky. Like you have the, the in a lot of the matchups you have these like clunky five drops, but you kind of need them around to win. Like, your deck's not very good at winning if you cut a lot of your, you know, synergy pieces at all. So that was tricky. Yeah, that was interesting. Like, I remember thinking, well, should you leave in all the red removal? Because it doesn't have great targets in this matchup. But if you cut them, you no longer have the Dark Dweller combo. So, yeah, like, it's it's tricky. Yeah. This is one of those, I mean, it's, it's a common thing where, like, we come up with a sweet synergy package, but then... It's just much easier for the opponent to disrupt us game two, and it's much harder for us to adapt because we don't have the same flexibility in like swapping slots in and out. Right. If you're only going to play against people playing uh, creature decks, then this is reasonable, right? It, it, once you start running into things like Phoenix, uh, we didn't run into any of the actual like spell-based combo decks, but those would have been a problem as well. It's Those are unsolvable matchups, it feels like. Game one against creature decks. B best of one letter. That's what this is for. <laughs> this is mm -hmm. the perfect deck for your best of one letter. <laughs> Absolutely. Cannot highly recommend this enough. All right. Well, uh, glad you got to try it. I mean, David played two leagues and he had really promising results. He was du double 4-1, I believe. Yeah, double 4-1. Yeah. I think after your leagues, we're, we're closer to that 50% mark now. But, you know, like <laughs> you're saying, you're, you're just experimenting with it, just trying it out, dipping your toes in. So Sure. The truth is somewhere between. <laughs> yeah, it was a fun way for me to get uh, re-familiarized with Pioneer, which will help uh, as we come into Brothers War Season for uh, Pioneer. And uh, we also came up with a great name for it, which was Dark Dweller Duplomancy. So that's always an important point. Shout out to Kilgore Trout, who always has the best names for his deck lists, uh, keeping us uh, as high as we can on our deck naming standards. <laughs> All right, so I think that does it for our flashback on Vesuvian Duplomancy and Arcane Proxy, our first brew session of the Brothers War season. Yeah, absolutely excited to uh, check that card out and many others once they finally go fully live. Uh, with... I think they're fully live on four days. Is that correct? We're trying to figure it out. Yeah, it's, I think it's on the 15th. Yeah. By the time people are hearing this, it's likely out. Yes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Hopefully everything has gone well and uh, escape cards are no longer broken. Also, we have been getting more spoilers of the Shamstart anime, and there's a spectral sailor anime girl, and everybody's losing their mind. I, I don't know what that is, but okay. I have no idea what you're doing. <laughs> what? I just send it on stage because it's going to hurt your boomer hearts. Jumpstart anime the episode is over we have wrapped up all of the, <laughs> the topics i know i know i just gotta hurt you before the end and now we'll hear from more to whatever random thing more is <laughs> that's how it works running. okay i just googled jumpstart anime and i seem to have gotten nothing 
All right, I'm just going to cut this section. I don't know what we're talking uh-huh. about anymore. Uh-huh. <laughs> all right, this is all cuts. Farewell, gentlemen. Always a pleasure. Always a pleasure. Thanks, Dan. Have a nice evening and see ya. Bye-bye. See you soon. Deck list for this episode can be found at our homepage, faithlessbrewing.com. And tune in next time for our testing results, plus a look at the week one tech from the Brothers War. Support for this podcast is provided by brewers like you. Join the Faithless family and help support the show at patreon.com slash faithlessbrewing for Discord access, bonus content, and more. That's all for today. Stay safe and we'll see you next time. What the hell is this anime stuff?